to be in the Father's house tonight, amen? Do not let Satan rob you of God's blessings. As I said before, I know there may be a lot of things going on outside these walls and in your life, but do not let Satan be a thief of God's word in your heart. And remember this, people are watching you and the kind of example that you set to the people around you. I don't know about you, but I like happy people around me, so I'm going to be happy. Come on. All right. Amen. And, and I'm not saying you got to go around like a, like a weird person and just, you know, laughing all the time. And you're, I'm not thrilled with everything in my life, but I'm happy because I know who holds the future. Amen. I know who has everything under control. So I'm not worried. And if you're worried, then that means you have a little God because you have a big problem. But the bigger your God gets, the smaller your problem gets. You see how that works? It's kind of a faith and fear pump, right? Your faith gets high, your fear gets low. Your fear gets high, your faith gets low. So you know what you need tonight. More importantly, God knows what you need tonight. God has given me his word, and I'm going to attempt to minister it. I ask that you stretch your hands this way and um, ask the Lord to anoint me tonight. I've already felt his anointing, but ask him to speak through me only the things that he would have me to say as he's given his word. Heavenly Father, Lord, I stand before you nothing, but you are everything. Lord, I ask you to anoint my lips of clay and let me speak as an oracle of God ministering your word. Lord, not just to this congregation, but to myself and Lord, those that are watching online right now. God knows where each one of us are. God knows what each one of us are going through. And it would be a shame to make this night about our problems when it should only be about God. It would be a shame to make our lives only about our problems, our conversations only about our problems when it's really all about God. And so, Lord, if we have things kind of mixed up, as I tend to do sometimes, and I'm sure many others, Lord, set my priorities right where I proclaim the love of God, the name of Jesus, knowing that he holds the future, that I may not know what's going to happen the next second, but Lord, you know everything. And I thank you, and I love you, in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Uh, Brother Joe, would you come here just a second? While Brother Joe's coming here, would you please turn to John 14, John 14. Do you have John 14? All right, there's two of them. What about the rest of you? Okay. Now, if the person beside you is still turning, just say they don't. Okay. <laughs> Listen to these words, John 14 and 15. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Pretty simple, right? Could have just quoted it. Probably should have, Sassy. Could have saved all that Bible search, couldn't I? If you love him, you keep his commandments. Pretty simple. If you love Jesus, you keep his commandments. Now, go over to 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, you will find 2 Kings right after 1 Kings. Leanna, now you know where to find it. 2 Kings, South Green, you know how it is. Just kidding. My wife went there. 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. The Bible says this, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria. Can you say Naaman? Naaman, Naaman was his name. He was a Syrian and he was the captain of the host of the Syrian. When they said the captain of the host, in other words, he was the top dog. He was the man in charge. Only above him was the king. So you had the king of Syria and then you had Naaman. That's the way it was. Naaman had a lot of power. Naaman had a lot of things on his business card, if you could see it. Naaman had a lot of influence. He had a big house. He had a wife. He most likely, almost definitely had a bunch of kids too. But the Bible says something else about Naaman right here. It was a great man with his master, in other words, the king, honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. 
He was also a mighty man of that, in valor. In other words, he didn't tell his troops to go into battle. He didn't say, hurry, go over there and fight them and go over there and fight them. He said, follow me as I fight them. He didn't send his troops to go do anything. He wasn't first going to lead himself. We see that a lot of times with society. We see that a lot of times with parents. You need to do this. You need to do that. Hey, well, how about you do it and then I'll do it. How about that? Amen. The Bible st stops by saying, but he was a leper. The title of my sermon tonight is, I Thought. Got into trouble by saying that a lot of times. Something happened, well, I thought. As a matter of fact, Ken and I decided to uh, put up a fan in the fellowship hall. And um, I had the part of reading partially the instructions, although it was given to me in Spanish. And I don't speak Spanish. But I figured it out, kind of. And there was one part that I missed. This fan has a receiver, right, in the fan. And this fan has a remote. And the remote and the receiver, they have these little dials on them. And you have to take the back off, and you have to take the receiver out the back off of it, and you have to dial them in to certain numbers. And then once they can communicate, it can work. Well, I saw that they were all on the same numbers anyway, so I just left it alone. What I failed to read was, see, I read that part that they had to be the same. But I failed to read what I thought would work, did not work. What I failed to read was, these are the factory settings. It will not work with the factory settings. But I thought, Lynette, it was going to work. I thought I had everything going right, and when I clicked the on button, birdie, it didn't work. I thought it was going to work. Oh, yeah. I heard this old saying, you get your thought or busted. Yeah, yeah. Anybody ever gotten into trouble or been really frustrated because of yourself, and you could have started out with, well, I thought... Maybe a mouth jumped ahead of your brain and you said, well, I thought, after it all came out. Come on, talk to me. Mm, mm. It's not good when you eat foot, is it? No. I want to tell you something. Many people will go to a dry cleaner and uh, they will ask them how to, instead of sending an entire piece of fabric or an entire uh, suit or dress or skirt or shirt, to the dry cleaner, they'll just call up a dry cleaner and say, hey, listen, I got this stain here. How do I get it out? And the dry cleaner will give them instructions a lot of times, if they're nice. They'll give them instructions on how to get that out without having to spend the money to take the dry cleaner. And if you follow the instructions, it comes out. Many people will go to a salon and get a manicure or a pedicure. And they go there because something's messed up and they're gnarly toenails and fingernails, cuticles all crazy. Yeah, I know that word. And they'll fix them. They know what to do, the process to take to fix that. Many people will go to a garage because the car's making sounds it shouldn't or not moving at all. Take it to a garage, and they'll fix it. Sometimes it's just making a sound, and you can go to the auto parts store and say, hey, listen, it's making this sound. It's coming from this area. Oh, yeah, that's your, and you have the instructions, and you fix it. While we've been remodeling the fellowship hall, See, last year we remodeled the entire sanctuary. I mean, just the walls, the, the lights, and, and, and the paint scheme and all that stuff, muddy and everything like that, and the hallways in the back. And there were a couple of times when Charlie and I were over in these areas, we looked up some YouTube. <laughs> there has been a few times where we've looked up some YouTube tutorials in the back. Okay, how does this go? Because I'm not a plumber, I'm not an electrician, but I put some lights up. Because I thought that's how it worked. But then I had to go find out somebody that knew how it worked. But if I'd have followed the directions, everything would have been fixed. It's funny how people have things in their lives that are messed up. Have things in their lives that are so messed up. And they come to church because they know God is the answer. They know deep down God is the answer. His instructions are the answer. God says, do this and this and this. Many times, Charlie and I have been in counsel with somebody. They say, I've got this problem, this problem. Okay, here's what the word says. Do this and this. This is what the word says. I promise you it'll work. And they come back and say, I've got this problem, this problem still. Did you do this and this? Well, no. 
Why is it we will take advice from a manicurist? We'll take advice from a mechanic. We'll take advice from people at YouTube tutorials. But we, we come to God's house about the biggest situations in our lives. We don't necessarily want to take that advice. Yet we want it fixed. Mm. You see, this guy Damon was kind of like that. He had everything going for him, Christina. Everything going for him. He had power. He had, I mean, he had might. He was, he, he, he could say the word and, 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 and lives were, were either spared or they were killed. This guy had everything. He was second only to the king. In other words, if the king wasn't there and he said something, everybody in the land had to do it. I'm telling you, this guy had everything going for him. As a matter of fact, when he walked by, people would bow. Because by his intellect, the Syrian army had taken over. They were the world power at that time. They had taken over everything. Think about that. But then the Bible says, but he was a leper. It's amazing how you can have everything in your life going for you. And so many things are right. But then there's that one thing. I wonder tonight what's your one thing. Let's find out what Naaman's was. The Bible tells us right here. It says, but he was a leper. No matter the power, no matter the title, there was something in his life that was messing everything else up. He was a leper. I wonder what's going on in your life that's messing everything else up. Maybe you can't get you out of the way. Maybe it's that everything else is more important than the most important. Uh, maybe, you know, I wonder how Naaman felt how, how, how he felt like he was maybe betrayed a little bit. He's like, my family doesn't have leprosy. Nobody else in the Syrian army has leprosy. And here I am, the leader, second in command in all the land, and I have leprosy. He could have blamed his gods, little g gods, because he served many gods. He could have blamed all his little gods for that. But if God hadn't allowed him to get leprosy, we wouldn't have this story here tonight. Somebody here, maybe more than one somebody here, is wondering why God has allowed certain things to happen to them. Well, maybe if he hadn't allowed that to happen, you wouldn't be here right now. Come on. Talk to me. God has a purpose for everything. Nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens by chance. The Bible says, in verse number 2, and the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. It's amazing to me. This little maid is not even given a name. Ashlyn, she's not even mentioned by name. All she's mentioned is she's a little maid. In other words, she was probably a teenager that was taken out of her land, that was taken away from her parents. Her parents may even have been killed by this guy's army under his orders. And now she's a maid in his house as a slave. That's what her job is now. Now imagine that. But she was raised correctly. She was raised godly. How many of us, when bad things happen to us, can keep that, that spiritual center? Can, can keep that spiritual bearing to where, hey, it doesn't matter what happens. I'm a godly person. I'm not going to act like that. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to be spiteful like that. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to go off on them, even if they're talking about my mama. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And she waited on Naaman's wife. Imagine having to serve the very one that gave the order to kill your family members and to take you into slavery. Verse number three says this. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet. In other words, she's saying, I wish that my master could see the prophet who was in Samaria. She's talking about Elisha. For he would recover him of his leprosy. That's amazing. This little maid, Sister Janie, was not even given a name in the word of God. However, the, most, the second most powerful man in all of Israel, in all of the region, in all of Samaria or, or Syria at that time, he didn't know anybody that could help him because leprosy was an incurable disease. And this little maid that had every reason to keep her mouth shut, even if she knew the cure to leprosy. I wonder how many of us would have acted that way. We know somebody's getting hurt and they've done something to us. Let them get hurt. If they die, 
they died. That was from Rocky. when He fought the Russian guy. Never mind, we'll talk about it later. I wonder how many of us would have been a little bit nice and been like, man, there's this prophet in Samaria. His name's Elisha. He knows a great and mighty God, and he can recover him of his leprosy. I know. I have faith. Or how many of us would have just kept our mouths shut? Let it happen. Now, how many of us need prayer? Amen. All right. Now we got some honest people in here. That's all right. That's good. That's good. Because we can grow once we realize the problem, right? It's amazing how this, as the world saw her, nobody. As the world saw this little girl, she was nobody. She was a slave in her master's house. She was nobody. But she knew somebody. The world may look at you as nobody, but let me tell you something. You know somebody. And that somebody can do amazing miracles. That somebody can do amazing things. But you've got to give them a the referral. Can I get an amen? Now, watch this. Verse number four. And one went in. In other words, it was this guy. It was Naaman. And Naaman went in and told his Lord, told the king, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he, Naaman, departed and took with him ten talents of silver. Watch this total. Ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. And the kings of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. Whoa, this little maid didn't say anything about the king of Israel. This little girl said nothing about the king of Israel. She was talking about a prophet in Israel that knew God that could recover him. And this king was like, oh, okay, government can take care of this. Oh, oh. Because if you throw a lot of money at it, it always fixes a situation, right? Right? In, in, in currency today, that's over $6 million the king sent with Naaman. He was going to pay for the miracle. Boy, that sounds like a lot of television preachers right there. That, I mean, I'm just saying, from the commercials I've seen, send your faith seed of at least $100, and we'll send you this vial of holy water that's been out of the Jordan River. Are you kidding me? My God doesn't need trinkets and tricks to work. All he needs are his children to be obedient to his word. And he says, my blessings are on the way. It's not about getting the cross that you can look through in the sunlight and see the Lord's prayer and you're healed. It's not about that. You don't need a preacher to heal you. You don't need to put money in the offering plate to heal you. You don't need to be a part of this church or a part of this denomination to heal you. You don't need anything but God. Can I get an amen? You don't need to be reliant on anyone except for God. God's the only one that can do anything. Listen, that kind of talking right there wouldn't go in most churches. It's going to go here because it's all about Jesus Christ. It's not about me and it's not about this church. It's about Jesus. And Jesus is the only one that can save us. And he's the only one that can heal us. And he's the only one that can set our feet on a solid path. He's the only one that can give us direction. He's the only one that you need to know. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter the sickness you have. It doesn't matter the mental problems you have. God has the solution. Because he is the solution. Woo! And the king of Syria said, go to go. I'm going to pay for this and we'll take care of this. The government will take care of it. Now, I'll let you go ahead and think for a few moments on all the things that the government's done for you. It doesn't work. It is the God that gave us this country. He is the only one that can heal this country. It's not going to be more laws, and it's not going to be more legislation. It's not taking this away and giving that back. It's not anything like that. It is Jesus Christ. Your Savior does not sit in the Kremlin. Your Savior does not sit in the White House. Your Savior does not sit on Capitol Hill, does not fly in Air Force One, but He is the one. He is the King. He is the King of Kings. And it's time we stop looking to Washington for hope and answers. 
There's nothing there. Can you see it now? But there's everything in the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. There's hope there. And he'll never let you down. And he doesn't look at you and charge you for anything. Amen. I don't know about you, but I get tired of seeing that money already taken out before I get the check. Before I even see it, it's gone. I digress. Verse number six. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto you, behold, I have herewith sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may recover him of his leprosy. Imagine getting a letter from the most powerful person in all the land, Lanet, and they come up to you, and they say, All right, here's a letter from the king. You have to cure cancer. What's the matter with that? A little bit of pressure, Lynette. Because when you didn't do what the king wanted, you lost your head. Just a little bit of pressure. Can you imagine how this king, he's sitting there in the palace. He's already been conquered by the Syrians. He's just trying to run a country. And guess what? He gets a letter from the king. And he's like, hey, time to cure leprosy. What? And you know what he thought? He's like, and this king just wants to kill me. He just wants to have another war. That's all he wants. He doesn't even like me. Why is he picking a fight? Verse number seven. Watch this. And it came to pass when the king of Israel read the letter that he read his clothes. Talk about stressed out. Now, I'm glad we don't do that today. Or we get stressed out. <laughs> Seems like, you know, they didn't have Walmart back then. You know, they didn't have coals, they didn't have pennies, they didn't have goodies, they didn't have all these other burks, they didn't have all these plates, they didn't have belts, they didn't have that stuff. They had to hand make their clothes, but they spent half the time tearing the clothes up. Every time there's a situation. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Be a lot of tattered clothes in here tonight if we did that. Can I get an amen? Yes, amen. Watch this. The king rent his clothes. Can you imagine the, the king's seamstress or seamster? He's <laughs> like, oh, God. there's another problem. I'm going to get the thimbles. Anyway, and he rent his clothes and said, Am I God? To kill and make alive that this man doth send to me to recover this man of leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. He just wants to fight. Verse 8. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? He's like, why are you tearing your clothes up again? See, he had the same problem I do with it. Can you imagine that, Tammy? Imagine sassy growth. Christina. Growing up in your house, and every time you put a change of clothes on her and something bad happened, peanut butter and no jelly? <laughs> You're not going to tie my shoes? <laughs> every single time. Get frustrated with that. Don't focus on that. Let's go on. <laughs> Elisha had the same problem, though. Elisha said, look at this. He's torn his clothes again. Man, he's not even acting like a king. You got a problem? Don't tell your clothes. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Tore his clothes. He said, tell the king. He said, send Naaman here. And he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now, whenever there was a prophet in Israel, the God of the prophet always got the credit. So he was going to give the credit to God. Now, verse number nine, watch this. So Naaman came with his horses. Oh, imagine. Imagine, Janie, the splendor of gold and silver and brass just shine, highly polished, and an entourage of chariot after chariot after chariot, and they would have guys that would run before them with shields and spears. I mean, an entire entourage coming up to the door of Elisha. Elisha is sitting in his lazy boy rock chair. Amen? Because that's what they had. That's what they had. Now Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. He got down. He didn't even send his servant. Naaman got down out of his chariot. He said, wait here, boys. Went there, fluffed my robe. Knock, knock, knock. Elisha didn't even get up. He's like, who's at the door? The servant said, hey, uh, it's Naaman. He's the uh, second in command of all Syria. 
the one that's over all the army. Yeah, he's got like a couple hundred guys out here, and he's got about, uh, I don't know, around about five, six million dollars in cash. Gehazi was the bad guy. He was Elisha's servant. Should have paid attention. I'll tell you about that one later. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times. Y'all know what the French broad looks like after it rains a lot? Filthy. You wouldn't go take a white shirt to clean it up in that river. Can I get an amen? On a normal day, you wouldn't take a white shirt to clean it up in that river. But after it rains, that swirling, muddy mess, Elisha didn't get up out of his seat. You see, here's the problem. We think God's going to work in a certain way. When we pray, we say, God, I need you to do this and this and this. And when God doesn't do it when we want him to do it or the way we want him to do it, we get frustrated. I get frustrated. Like, Lord, I thought you were going to do this. I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought. Let's look. What's this? This man is filthy. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament law said if you had leprosy and you started to walk towards somebody, if they got about from me to Lanette and I had leprosy, when Lanette got that close, I'd say, I'm clean! And Lynette turned around, she started to walk away, and Robin started getting close. I'd say, I'm clean! I had to warn them. And if I wanted to have something to eat, I had to beg anybody that walked by, throw me some food! Throw me some food! Now check this out. It took a bowman at the front of the city to take an arrow and a bow, and he would fire that arrow. And wherever that arrow landed, that's where the lepers had to stay. That was the leper colony. That's where they had to stay. Now think about that. This guy was filthy, and he goes up to the door. Elisha doesn't even come up, not even honoring him, sends his servant to him, and his servant comes up, Gretchen, and says, my master says, go wash yourself in the muddy Jordan seven times. In other words, dip down in it about seven times. He said, when you come home seven times, he said, um, you'll be clean. Pretty simple. You want to be healed. Here's the way to be healed. You want your car fixed. Here's the way to fix your car. You want your nails done. Here's the way to get your nails done. You want your hair did. Here's how to get your hair did. Verse number 11. But Naaman was wroth. What? That's what he went there for. He went there to have a healing. The guy said, go to the Jordan and get a healing. And he said, dip down seven times. Real simple. I'm not asking you to climb the top of a mountain. I'm not asking you to do anything, tightrope walk or anything like that over the Grand Canyon. Just dip in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman's angry. And went away. And said, behold, what are those next two words? Say it louder. Mm. I thought it was going to be a certain way. Listen to what he had made up in his mind. He rode up to Elisha's door and he's like, here's what Elisha's going to do. He's going to see me in all, my in all my robes and all my gold and silver. He's going to see all my pomp and all my circumstance and I'm going to walk up and he's going to do this. Watch this. I thought he would surely come out to meet me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place. He was going to go like this. He's going to wave his hands over it and recover the leper. He's like, I thought he was going to do all this. I thought God was going to take care of that bill for me. I thought God would shut her mouth. I thought God would just go ahead and let them go right now. Let them get out of my life. I thought. You see, what God does is up to God. When God does it, it's up to God. Your part is to be obedient to what God said. So because what he thought God was going to do was different than what God wanted to do, he's going away as filthy as he came. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And even worse off, because now he's angry. I love the servant. Verse number 12. He says this. He says, Are not Arbana and Farfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of it? He said, These are real clean rivers up in Syria. He said, Look at this muddy Jordan. You see, when he looked at the rivers, he looked at the cleanliness of the water. 
He looked and he saw Farfar and, and Abana, and he said, these rivers are so pretty. Why don't he have me go right there and just dip down there? I don't want to get all that mud on me. I'm a clean man. I mean, I do have an incurable disease, but you know I'm clean other than that. I don't want to go down to this muddy Jordan. But see, Elisha knew something different. Elisha knew something different. Elisha knew that Jordan was the Jordan of miracles. That's where God had done many, many miracles before him. As a matter of fact, just a few years prior, Elisha and Elijah, his, his, his mentor, they came up to the Jordan, and Elijah took off his outer cloak, and he hit the water, and the water parted. There was a miracle right there. Many, many years prior to that, the children of Israel went over on dry ground, and the water heaped up all the way back to the city of Adam. There was another miracle right there. After Elijah went over and Elisha went over, Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind and a chariot to heaven, and his mantle, his outer cloak fell down, and Elisha caught it. And Elisha walked up to the river Jordan. He said, where is the God? He wrapped it around his hand. He said, where is the God of Elijah? And he hit the water, and the water parted. Another miracle. Yeah. So when he said, go to Jordan, he said, this is the Jordan. Of, you want a miracle? This is the Jordan of miracles. Let me tell you something. Yeah. But you have to be obedient. Can I get an amen? Yeah. You want God to heal you. You have to be obedient to what his word says. You want God to fix your mind. You've got to be obedient to what God says. You want God to deliver you from addiction you got to be obedient to what God says you want life to work out be obedient to what God says see Dayton too many people think God's going to tell them to do something that they just do not want to do I really like this thing I really like this person I really like going to this place and if I give my heart to God and I start following God, he's going to make me stop these things. And I've got to stop this lifestyle. And I've got to stop that. You know what? They don't understand that when you give your life to God and you realize what all God did for you on the cross of Calvary, you don't have to stop anything. You want to stop it. Anything that gets in between you and God, you want it out of the way because you've never lived a better life than a life that's devoted totally to God. If God's going to invest his son's life in you, why would he have a bad future plan for you? People always think, Sandy, I'm going to give my heart to God and I'm going to be in the jungles of Africa and I'm going to be sitting there and I have malaria and I'm going to get snake bit and oh, the life of a Christian. Yeah, God really loves you doing that to you, right? God knows you better than you know yourself. And he can make you happier than you ever thought possible before you leave here tonight. But it comes in obedience to his will. Now, so he turned away, so he turned and went away in a rage. Watch this. And his servant came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, if he'd have told you to climb to the mountain, if he'd have told you to walk over a, a, the Grand Canyon on a tight rope, he said, You'd have done it because you're that kind of guy. How much then shouldn't you just were right here in Israel, the Jordan's right there, how much more should you just go, go ahead and do what he says and be clean? A servant was pretty wise. As a matter of fact, he surrounded himself with wise servants. That little girl, and now this servant, that's pretty smart. Verse 14. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. Imagine that. This guy, he had to strip himself of all of these beautiful things that the world said, man, look how powerful this guy is. Look how glorious this guy is. Look at all that alphabet before and after their name. Look at those certificates on the wall. Look at those trophies in that case. Look at the height. Look at the bank account. Look at the possessions. Look at the cars. Look at the houses. He had to strip himself of all those things, and it was just him going into the water. It was just him and the mud squishing between his toes. And he went into that water, and he was obedient. And he went down the first time. You know, if he had only dipped himself six times, he would have come up, still a leper. We got too many six-time Christians. You know, I came to church for years, and I love God, and then I asked God for something, and he just wouldn't do it. Now, I know God wanted me to do this, and I, I didn't do it, but, but God never did ask. Obey him fully. Yes. Obey him completely. <laughs> then 
There's a lady that a long time ago used to come to church here. And she had an addiction. And she would come up and she would get prayed for and much of nothing would happen. Not because of her addiction, but because of her disobedience to God's word. And I remember my dad praying, and he was praying for her, and he said, look at me. He said, quit this. He said, that's coming in between you and God. You rely on this for peace. You rely on it for happiness. You rely on this for, 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 for your nerves to be calm. You rely on this. You put it before the other needs that you have in your household. You are, you are bound by this. Quit that. Her whole demeanor kind of changed. She turned around. She went and sat down. She got up. When the service was over, my dad was in the back, and he was shaking hands. She looked at him. She said, if God wants me to get rid of it, he'll take it away. She walked out. My dad caught her at the door. He said, let me tell you something. He said, I didn't tell you what I wanted to tell you. He said, I told you what God told me to tell you. He said, secondly, God didn't give it to you to take it away. You picked it up. Now you put it down. She huffed and puffed and went out. I would hate to think that there are people under the sound of my voice, including myself, that need God to deliver me from my anger, that need God to deliver me from my frustration, need God to deliver me from my addictions, need God to deliver me from my, from my attitude, need God to deliver me from my stubbornness. And God says, put it down. And you know what? I dip six times but I just won't go down to seven because of my pride. The Bible says this, he totally obeyed. He dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. Imagine that. He had better skin than a little baby. How soft that man was. Put that armor on, it just slid right off. Him. All right, little baby skin. <laughs> God doesn't just cleanse. He renews. He made him like new. Imagine that. Not a blemish on his flesh at all. Not, not an ingrown hair. Not a pimple. Not a red spot. Not some rosacea. Nothing. Not no eczema. No dandruff. He came up like a little baby skin. Glow, just looking around. I like to think he had a little baby face too when he came up. Looking at his soldiers like, I don't know how that happened. But it makes me happy thinking about it. Verse number 15. And he returned to the man of God and he and all his company and came and stood before him. And he said, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth. Wait, wait a minute. Behold, now I know. That's what God was trying to do in the first place. That's why he had leprosy in the first place. Because it wasn't just he that knew. Yes, we see this account from Naaman. Now I know of the true God. But now the king of Israel knew of the true God. Now the king of Syria knew of the true God. Now all the company that was with him knew of the true God. Now everybody that knew that he was a leper knew that he was cleansed and they would hear of the true God. Because you know what this man did? He went and he said, get me a couple of barrels. He said, even when I go back to my hometown, I want that mud right there in those barrels. We're going to take it with me. So everywhere I go to pray, we're going to dump some of that mud out, and I'm going to put my feet on it. Because I want to remember this miracle that God made for me. Watch this. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. He said, hey, let me, let me give you something in return. But he said, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. God's miracles, God's blessings... God's will for your life is not to be bought. You cannot buy it. That's why it makes me mad when people come to church, they're in need of something, and they come to church, they try to open the door for people, and they're real nice, and they're there for every service for like a week. And then they put money in the offering plate, and they're like, okay, God, now you can't buy God's blessings. He's looking at your heart, and if your heart isn't changed, his blessings are coming your way. Amen. He wants to know that you're for him. Not for just his blessings. And he said, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. He said, no. Now, in the background, the servant's kind of watching this. Mm -hmm. And Damon said, shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules, burden of earth, in other words, two big barrels, 
For the servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. You see, he didn't just make his skin new. He made his entire person new. Isn't that beautiful? That God changed. See, the biggest thing in his life at that time, Robin, was that he was going to die. It was a terminal illness. Leprosy started in the skin, and it started eating away at the skin. Every day, his leprosy was eating away at him. Leprosy in its advanced stages causes fingers to fall off, causes ears to fall off, noses, lips, everything like that. They start falling off until you eventually just die. Imagine being eaten away with this cancer every day. By the way, sin is a cancer, and sin is eaten away at you every single day until it's covered by the blood of Jesus, the only thing that can cleanse you. He was cleansed of everything because of his obedience. He said, I will not sacrifice to any other God. He said, because they're just little gods. He said, but I will sacrifice unto the Lord. Verse number 18. In this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimon, this is a false god. He said, when the king goes in to, the, to worship the false god, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon. When I bow down myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. He said, it's my job to take the king the king's hand, because I'm his right-hand man, it's my job to take the king's hand and go into this false god's house. He said, God, please forgive me. He said, I'm not doing this because I'm worshiping that god. Hmm. And he said unto him, go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. We're going to stop right there. For an immature Christian... It's a huge problem for a seasoned, mature Christian. It's an opportunity. Whatever you're facing for the mature Christian, it's a smile and knowing God will answer in just a little while. But for the immature Christian, it's tears and fears. My question to you tonight is, will you obey and live in faith? Or will you continue down this road and let the cancer of sin keep on eating at you every single day until you die? And there are only two places to go when you die. There is no such thing as purgatory. That was a made-up manly thing. There is heaven and there is hell. Good people do not go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. You can be good all your life and not be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, not ask God to forgive you of your sins, and you will still go to hell. Plain and simple. But the Bible says this, you don't have to. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then the Bible says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. In other words, you obey my word. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I ask you, please, don't move around. And just concentrate on what I'm going to ask you right now. Maybe you don't know God or you've strayed from God. Maybe you've never really made a commitment to God. Oh, you made a commitment with your mouth, but not your actions. And the sin, the leprosy of sin, the cancer of sin is still eating at you. You don't have peace. You don't have happiness. You don't have joy. And all of these things are blessings of God, but they only come with obedience to God. And so you realize that the key to unlocking all of the blessings of God and everything you want in this life, that key that unlocks that is obedience to God's word. Maybe you haven't been living in obedience to God's word. I got to tell you, God's going to give you another chance tonight. He loves you so much that he gave his word again. He believes in you so much. You know, we always talk about believing in God. God believes in you so much that he's given you another chance to live for him, to really make a difference in your family, in your community, to live for something bigger than yourself, to live a life that really matters, to care for other people. You were made for that. And to only think about yourself makes you really, really miserable. The kindness and the love that God has for you, he also wants to show through you to others. But it comes in obedience. In obedience. 
be God's word. If there's one here tonight that needs to pray and ask God to forgive them of their sins, and you want God to restore you so that if you died tonight, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. When you stand before God, your almighty creator, that he looks and he says, this one was forgiven, come into heaven. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And you can do it out loud or you can do it quietly, but I want you to pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Lord, I can't live the Christian life with just me wanting to. It takes your power. I've sinned against you. I've lived a sinful lifestyle. I've done sinful things. But I want all that to be changed. I want you to throw all of that into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. And even though other people might throw it up, you'll never remember it. And I'm going to stand before you one day, and it could be today. And I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. And you said in your word, if I ask and I believe, then you will forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Lord, let me dip that seventh time and come up and be made totally new. Let me be washed in the blood that flowed down the cross of Calvary. So when you look at me, you don't see sin. You see that I am pure and you have forgiven me. And now I have a purpose in you. I ask you to do this in Jesus' wonderful name. If you prayed that prayer, with no one looking around, please, if you prayed that prayer, would you slip a hand up and write back down? Yes, amen. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. All over this church, praise the Lord. You don't have to fear anything now. Listen to me. You have nothing to fear now. Because God has just taken your past, your present, and your future, and he said, now I'm working it all for good. Whereas before you were saved, everything bad that happened to you would cause something bad to happen to you again. But everything bad that's happened to you now will happen and it will work for good. That's what the word says. So I want you to smile. And when Satan comes in and says, well, you're not going to live it. You're still going to be addicted. You're still going to go here. You're still going to see that. You're still going to do this. You tell him what happened here this night. You tell him that you are saved and you are blood-bought and that Jesus loves you. And if you love him, he says you do his commandments. You walk by his word. And even if you stumble, so what? Get up and do it again. There may be some here tonight that just need to recommit themselves. You've been... You've been one of those six-time dippers. You haven't committed to that seventh time. You haven't committed all the way. You've been obedient up to a point, but you haven't been totally obedient. If that's you, I ask you to just slip a hand up and write back down. We're going to pray. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. All right. Now let's pray. God, I ask you in our lives right now, mine included, my hands up. Lord, I ask you right now to make me totally obedient to your word. Lord, you haven't given up on me. Everybody else may have, but you haven't. And Lord, you know what I've done more than anybody else does. You know the thoughts that have been in my head and in my heart more than anybody else. And you still haven't given up on me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I ask you to make me obedient to your will. And now, church, I'm going to be quiet just a little bit. And I want you to just talk to the Lord. Maybe you haven't talked to him in a while. He's listening. Talk to him.
do you love the Lord? How about the rest of you? Would you stand with me, please? I first want to thank you already for your obedience to being in God's house tonight. That's a beautiful thing. And I got good news for you. We got church Sunday. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, amen. Starts at 10 o'clock, greatest school in the world. It's called Sunday School. And we got one just for your age group. No matter how old or young you are, we got one just for you. And it's going to be a wonderful time in the Lord. We're going to sing. We're going to praise the Lord. And we're going to feel the love of God. And let me tell you something. Whatever you came to God's house for tonight, if you don't have it, it's not because of God. And I also want to encourage you, if you need something from the Lord, stay here till you get it. No one's going to run you out of here. Believe in God. God is not bound by distance. He's not bound by walls or time. And let me tell you something. The name Jesus is the greater is greater than the name leprosy. Is greater than the name cancer. Is greater than any other name. Do you love him? Then believe on him. Wouldn't it be terrible if you knew the solution to every one of your problems and then you didn't adhere to it? You didn't follow the direction? Solution to all your problems. Follow the directions. Amen? Would you bow your heads, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your house tonight. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on us, even though people may have, even though we may have given up on ourselves. Lord, you didn't give up on us. Lord, thank you for giving us a church that loves you. Thank you for giving us this precious and this wonderful time with you. It doesn't have to stop. And Lord, even in our drives home, you're there. In our houses, you're there. When we go to bed tonight, you're there. When we wake up in the morning, you're there. As long as we keep you there. Lord, you are as close as your word. You said if we call on you, you will be there. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and the church said,